Hey everybody, I want to talk about a product and platform that I absolutely love and our latest sponsor, Interseller, the prospecting and outreach platform of choice for recruiters and sellers. Whether you're doubling down on business development or recruiting talent, Interseller does all the heavy lifting of finding contact data, automating the email and follow-up process, and syncs all that rich data into 20 plus CRM and ATS platforms. Reach out now and get going on a two-week free trial and let them know you heard about it from Adam on the podcast today. Check out the link on the website. Appreciate it. Welcome to the podcast, where we introduce you to incredible humans who share their journeys with the mission to inspire you to harness your own inner tenacity to drive your life and career forward. And now, your host, Adam Posner. Hey, everybody, welcome back to the podcast where I bring you the best in the world of business, marketing, and personal growth to help you harness your inner tenacity to drive your career forward. Tribe, I have a great one for you today. Thrilled to welcome my guest, Tucker Max, to the podcast. Maybe you know him from one of his four New York Times bestselling books like I Hope They Serve Beer in Hell, or more recently as a guy revolutionizing the self-publishing industry as the co-founder of Scribe Media a company that helps people write, publish, and market their books. And I'm excited to unpack a bit of Tucker's backstory and dig into Scribe. So let's do this. Tucker, Max, welcome to the podcast, my man. Thanks for having me, Adam. I'm thrilled to have you here. I'm even more excited that we talked about kangaroos and diapers before we uh, got on the show. And uh, ranch shopping, it's, it's incredible. So let me get this fanboy shit out of the way first so we could just move on here. And I hope they serve beer in hell was literally... The only book I read in a two-year period from 2006 to 2008 in my post-college years, we were living on the Upper East Side in Manhattan, and it was was just the Bible, and I decided to go back and read it again, and then I realized I don't have time to read it, so I went to the audio, so I went to the audio version. Uh, Did you, was it, tell me about the process of recording the audio book, and, and do you like that finished product? I have never listened to it. It's truly, I have no idea what it sounds like. Can I be honest with you? Totally. I, I got a couple minutes in and I was like, I want to go back and read the book again. Like, did you, did you, did, like, was it a tough process to read your own book? Um, man, I got you, you're taking And I mean me that with love and respect? Yeah, no, I'm trying to, like, <laughs> I barely remember the, that was 2005 that I recorded that audiobook, so it was 15 years, fuck, it was 15 D- years different ago. Different state of mind, different um, place. <laughs> yeah, I, I barely, re- it was in Chicago. The only thing I remember reading that audiobook was that I hated, I was really mad because I had edited my book a thousand times and I thought there was no, nothing to change or improve and reading it out loud. I heard like 50 things and I'm like, Oh God, if I just read this stupid thing out loud, I would have seen that. And so like, I guess I was probably angry the whole time I was reading it. <laughs> Truly. I, I, I mean, I went on, I went on Amazon, I went on audible and I listened, like I was about to buy it. I swear. I was like, all right, let yeah. me, like I, I can listen in the background while I'm doing work and other shit. And I listened to a couple minutes of it. And I'm like, I really, I don't think he's into it. Yeah. I'm like, I don't know. If, I, I don't know if I want to listen to this. And I'm like, let me just go back in my memory to the book and all the parts that I liked about it. Just keep it in yeah. that time and place, time and place. I, I genuinely cannot <laughs> remember anything about reading that except that I learned that lesson. It's one of the things that, that we teach in my company. I edit is read aloud. That's how I learned it was being angry at, at that, that reading. Yeah. And you and you just took my next question. I was about to say, you know, now it's scribe and I'm fast forwarding to later in the interview, but that's a that's a big like do you encourage everyone to once they get to the point where they're almost ready to hit, you know, finish publish to read the book, read maybe read it out loud even. Read it to their kids in bed. Not maybe <laughs> read it out loud, definitely. We literally it's part of our process. It's called the read aloud edit. And you have to read it to another person. Because you can't just mumble it under your breath of the computer, right? Yeah, I remember. Because when you read it out loud, you'll see, you'll hear all the problems with it. And then you correct them all. Um, and that's how I learned it, was that audiobook. That's the only thing I remember about recording that audiobook. Now, when you were going back to the early days, you know, those first set of books, I mean, how much of that technique did you actually, you know, employ yourself? Uh, at that point, I didn't, none of it. I mean, because that was like, I mean, dude, that was at the very beginning of my career as a writer. And God, it's only 15 years ago. It feels like 100 years ago. <laughs> it's so long ago that it's hard for me to even conceive that it's the same lifetime. 
Like, you know, so everyone's like, oh, it seems like yesterday. It doesn't seem like yesterday. It seems like it a actually, different universe. Oh, my God. We were it was so funny. We're, we're in the city this weekend. and It was the first time I've been on the island of Manhattan in 14 months. We live out in Long Island over here. Right. And uh-huh. we're driving through. And my wife and I are having, like, all this nostalgia of the bars we used to go to right. and everything. A couple of them are still there. And you're like, holy shit. That was literally 15, 16, 17 years ago. There's kids yeah. that were born and are just driving. Like, oh, my. Like. We're, we're getting old. We're getting old. So I want right. to, <laughs> it's crazy. Um, so career breakdown, like there's been many chapters in the Tucker Max story, um, but your personality and non-traditional approach are really at the center of those chapters. And there's so much honesty there. Um, do you ever feel like even at the times you were, you know, honest and wrong, like, you know, like, there was a conflict of like, how honest should you be? No, no, I, I have a lot of problems. It's never been a problem for me to tell the truth. Now, I, sometimes I don't know what it is. Like I'm wrong a lot, meaning like I see I'm seeing things wrong. But when I know something's the truth, or if I think whatever I think it is, I've never really had an issue. Um, I don't want to say I've never had any issue. That's not true. But it, it it's I always if there's a defining thing about me, it's that I am willing to speak truth. And it works both ways gets you in trouble yeah. and sometimes it protects you and and, <laughs> it, and what's, it it's like the george costanza thing it's not a lie if you believe it it's like the inverse of, of, of <laughs> it's a double-edged sword definitely like telling the truth it's one of those things where you're better off just going all in either either be a manipulative uh, asshole or just tell the truth i some people can can uh either or um weave that or, the lines. <laughs> yeah or they can you know they can thread that needle well I'm not one yeah. of those, like whenever I try to be deceptive, it just doesn't it, like it does. It's not who I am. So I'm just like, All right, I'm just going to tell the truth and it makes it easier. And it's interesting you say that because I had a conversation with somebody yesterday and I said, it's so much easier to just be yourself because it takes so much less effort. The amount of effort it takes to put on a facade and lie and keep up with those lies. I mean, that's unnecessary. It's just, I it's agree. Just, just a shitload of work. Uh, I want to go back to, to TuckerMax.com. You still own the site? Anybody try mm-hmm. to buy that off of you or anything? Uh, no, anybody, no. Like Russian ha- hackers tried to, you know. No, yeah. I mean, of course, you. they're always like, "Hey, for five thousand dollars, can you only put a hundred links on?" Or like, "No, no, but I, no." Uh-uh. <laughs> and it's and it's an interesting story, right? Like you you were in law school, and it was a bet between you and some of your friends, right? For the for the first yeah, and mm-hmm. and, and you and you and you kept like, what was it that made you keep wanting to write and share your stories after that first post? You know, man, what it was, honestly, we all graduated law school and we all went to different cities to work. And I went to Florida and I hated everything about my life. Like I genuinely hated my life and I had no idea what to do. I didn't have the courage to kind of recognize it to myself or to realize like I had to take a different path or anything like that. And so I just kind of got drunk and hooked up with dumb girls and, um, you know, because Florida is the armpit of America. At least it's a lot better now. Then it was really bad. Whoa, and whoa, whoa. everyone's but moving really to Florida bad? now. How much worse? Uh, well, and now everyone's moving to Florida. <laughs> everyone's moving to Florida now. Now, like, I know 50 cool people in Florida. At the time, there was zero. Not one. No one. Uh, like, Pitbull was the coolest person in Florida then. And so, like, <laughs> it was the worst. And so, like, it, I just had hated it. Like, it. Florida used to be, if you if you were old, it was great. And if you did a lot of drugs at clubs, it was great. And I was neither. I was young and I didn't do any drugs and I hated clubs. And so it was like, I was like this weird exotic animal in the wrong place, right? Like a kangaroo in Texas. No, (laughs) Texas is a great environment for kangaroos. More like a polar bear in Texas or something. Right, because it's native to... Right. Yeah, because it's good good weather here for for kangaroos. It's actually great for kangaroo breeding, to be honest. It it is, Exactly. (laughs) And so uh, I hated it, man. I really did. And so the way I dealt with my misery is get drunk, hook up with dumb girls, and then have all these horrible things happen to me. And then because I was miserable and I didn't want to feel any of these emotions. And then I would write funny stories about it to my friends. Like I would laugh about it and try and get them to laugh. And that's really how it, and they thought it was hilarious. And they started forwarding the emails to their friends. And it kind of took off from there. It's, I, I didn't write with any plan in mind. It was a way of doing therapy without doing therapy. I, I remember seeing the emails too, because they, they made the rounds and yeah. that and that was awesome. And that's kind of what was like the first like influencer marketing campaign, if you kind of think about it. Like great yeah. great roots there in, in that. But did you feel during that time you were a self-fulfilling prophecy? 
no, nothing about this felt, right. felt self-fulfilling at the time. It, it felt like I was falling ass backwards into both like awesomeness and horribleness at the same time. And was it just a, 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 a cluster of everything kind of happening where the book, you know, came about? I mean, how did the book come into existence? How did the first one, was it like people oh. pushing you? Like, was it like, oh no, I got, where you go, bro, you got to write this. You should put this in a book. It'd be awesome. It, it was, yeah. I mean, a lot of people said that, but like, it was such a long, tedious journey, man. It's so funny. Like everyone looks at everyone, everyone's successful says, oh, it was super hard and a long journey. And people look at them and like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But it was not, right? It was actually pretty easy. And like, no, it was really hard. <laughs> like, and it's the same with me. Like, like you know, random emails and then like public, then MTV filmed me for this random thing and it blew up and then publishers reached out and they kind of want to do a deal, but they wanted, they gave me bullshit terms and I turned them all down. And then it was like, I was out in the wilderness with nothing. Like I couldn't afford mm. protein to eat. Like, like it was, I, I was, my life was horrible and I, but I just kept writing and I kept at it and I, cause I didn't know what the hell else to do. And then like my site took off again and then like publishers came back a few years later. I mean, it's this long, crazy journey, man. There was Definitely times I couldn't pay rents. I was sleeping on people's sofas. It was awful, man. It was terrible. But I, I stuck with it, and I'm not going to be like, oh, I stuck with it because I had some high-minded ideal. Honestly, man, I stuck with it because I didn't know what else to do, and I hated everything else that was like possible. I hated being a lawyer. I hated business. I hated everything, and like this is the only thing that I'd ever been good at that people wanted me to do, and I knew it was good. So I just had to figure out a way to make it work, and eventually I did, but uh, I almost feel like it, it's it, like stupid stubbornness paid off but I had to stick with it for a long time, you know? And there's there's a lot of early self-awareness in there too, understanding what you like and what you don't like. You went to law school because you probably thought that was, I mean, what was your original mindset of wanting to be a lawyer? I mean, my wife's a lawyer, I get it, but like, how do, I didn't even ask, like, why the hell do you want to be a lawyer? Like, how do you, like, I want, I because, want to Because I'm an idiot. There's no self aware Dude, I was the <laughs> antithesis of self-aware at that point in my life. So I- Self-unaware. Okay. Yeah, no, for real. Like, I, I like uh, I, my thought process at the time, truly, uh, I went to the University of Chicago for undergrad, which is a pretty good undergrad. And, yeah. and so, it, it, I, you know, I thought I was the coolest, smartest kid on earth when I was just an idiot and a loser. Uh, but, you know, I thought that. And then so as a young dude, it's like, OK, well, how do I get status and money easily? Right. And so there's really three at the time. There were three options like startup culture hadn't taken off yet. If they had, I would have started a, a tech company. But at the time, you could either go be an investment banker be a management consultant, like work for Goldman Sachs, work for McKinsey, or go be yeah. a lawyer. Mm -hmm. And I knew guys, uh, friends of mine who were working for uh, 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 Goldman Sachs, and they were literally working like 110 hour weeks. And I'm like, uh, un unruly. That's, I remember that. I mean, unbelievable. I'm like, no, that's horrible. Why would I, I don't care how do much that? money you're making. If you do it hourly, that's not a lot of money. No, it's not. And then they were no all life. like, like doing a lot of coke and sleeping oh, with hookers and i'm like it. no no i'm not i'm not That's i'm not, not cool. into pay no i'm not paying for sex and i'm not doing blow it's just not gonna happen and so i'm like well, what about management consultants and then i'm like okay they're working less but 80 hour weeks right they travel uh, and they're getting paid a lot and they kind of seem cool but like they hate their lives and it's all bullshit. like that i'm like like, I, I'll never forget this one friend of mine who was an idiot when I, he was a senior when I was a freshman and he was a genuine idiot. And this dude worked, it wasn't McKinsey, it was, I don't know, Deloitte or Bain or somebody. And he was like telling people, experienced old people at companies what to do. And I'm like, I wouldn't follow that dude into the bathroom. <laughs> and and to, if he showed me the urinal, like if he was a bathroom attendant, I wouldn't do what he said. He's a moron. So I'm like, okay, I, then clearly this is a job for idiots. And the only thing left that was easy, that paid a lot of money, that gave you status was being a lawyer. Now, I was too young so the process of elimination. So the career yes. search journey. So because this show is based on careers. So for anyone listening who's looking for career advice from Tucker Max, <laughs> just a process of elimination. That's the takeaway here. No, but the one I got to was <laughs> the worst of the bunch. Like it was, it was awful. And the, the, the lesson I had to learn was if it looks like easy status and money, the, the, you don't see what the price is and the price is very high. And the price for being a lawyer is your soul. The price for all three of those jobs is your soul. You know, yeah, especially, especially as a lawyer. I mean, mm -hmm. I mean, we could get into that, but let's, let's not digress. Um, so 
the book took off, more books came, and then the movie came. You know, I hope I hope they serve beer in hell. Uh, the film adaptation. How did how did you feel about it when it was released? There was a lot of negative criticism about it. Um, I mean, there was a lot of ne- negative criticism about my books too. Like that's how it works, right? Um, yeah, Different like strokes. I don't know, man. I don't know. It it was that that did, whole did, period. The two years I spent in Hollywood was two of the worst years of my life. Like I really about hated LA. Oh, dude. You, I mean, <laughs> the, like, I, when I get, it's funny, man. I thought I was a soulless, sociopathic narcissist. And then I got to LA and I was like, oh, no, I have a soul. You were Bush and I, then. Oh, dude. I, like, I, dude, like, I'm like, no, I, not only am I not a sociopath, I actually am very empathic and have a soul. And I'm not even a narcissist. Like, I can't I imagine values. narcissism as much as, <laughs> right? Seriously. I'm like, oh, I had no idea what evil was until I got to Hollywood. And I'm like, okay, I, this is horrible. I'm not, I, no, 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 no. I'm not one of these people. Uh, and so, like, I left, man, everything about the movie was <clears throat> was uh, uh, horrible. And, and now, I'm, I'm not blaming, I had all kinds of problems, too. Like, the, the, uh, the, a lot of the problems with the movie, of course, I had the wrong director, the wrong this, the wrong that. And, and at the end of the day, I picked, I mean, I, I did an amazing job setting that thing up. I got it all set up in two years. Like I busted my ass, this, that. Quick. I picked all the wrong people, man. It was, that movie was a reflection that it, it should have worked. Honestly, the script was amazing. It had the right uh, core property. It has all the it elements. Didn't work. It had all the elements but- and it didn't work. And it was my fault, man, straight hmm. up. And so I had to really accept, it was one of those moments in life where you had to say, Am I going to double down on what I was doing that got me to that moment and, and just ignore this failure? Or am I going to actually internalize this and realize, all right, clearly there's something I'm doing that's not right. And it took me a few years, but I realized I, I didn't double down. I went the other way. And that's like I moved to Austin and now like it took me on a whole different trajectory in my life. You know? it's, it's, it's interesting to take a step back and, and look back at that decision, which looking back at it now... Right, you made the right move, and and that was you know to say that you've drastically rebranded yourself would be a complete understatement. You know what what was that moment? Was it the moment? Was it the movie that you realized the days of frat tire were behind you? Was oh, that yeah. was that the was it the movie? Was that the like no? Well, no, I because I mean I I knew I wasn't gonna write about frat tire forever. You're only in your twenties for so long, like, right? You can't be that like thirty eight year old writing about like you know yeah, that's weird. like I, one, I, I, that I one friend that's still doing it, you know. Right. I'm not going to be 40 in college bars sleeping with 19 year olds. That's skeevy. I'm not doing it. And so, uh, right, exactly. So I knew it was going to end eventually. And so, you know, I wrote my last frontier book. I forget how old I was, 34, 35 or something. And I'm like, all right, I'm done with it. Cool. Your playing days are over. You're playing to get off the field. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Exactly. (laughs) Yeah. So, I mean, what do you think of now of like the modern examples of that? If you look at like the bar stools of the world, you know, someone who kind of pioneered that, that genre. It's fine. Like, I, uh, what's his name? Dave Portnoy, Portnoy? right? Is Portnoy? Guy? Yeah. yeah. So, like, I, I, look, I, I, I don't really care. I like, I one way or the other, it's working for him. Cool for him. Good for him. Like, he's done some ballsy stuff. He's also done some stupid stuff. Whatever. I mean, like, I, I, I I've never gotten into. Well, I'm going to spend a bunch of time commenting on someone else's life or whatever. He, he, if what he's doing is good for him, cool. I got no problem with it. Like, I. I, I, I don't consume any of it, and I don't mean that as a judgment of him or anyone else doing frat tire type stuff. If they want to, if that's their level of consciousness and what they want to do, cool. I got no problem with it. I'm just not in that world anymore. It's just not interesting to me anymore. And it's so funny, man. Like, I'm 30 – I'm 45 now. At 25, there was nothing – you could never have convinced me that I wasn't going to want to go out with my friends and get drunk and pick up girls the rest of my life. And at 45, the idea of having to drink even four beers and staying out past eight o'clock is no, like, no, oh, no, no, no. Oh, God, get away. I, ugh, go oh, away. Talk- it, something happened to me, literally, it was on my 30th birthday where I wasn't able to drink anymore. I mean, I still drink. I mean, I, I, I love bourbon and scotch, but like, I cannot, the next day is a mess for me. No, my body no. at 30 turned off whatever function I had to 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 rehab myself internally yeah. and uh-huh. every time and, and then you also have to think about this like shit i got i got i got two young kids i'm gonna have to wake up in the morning i'm gonna feel like shit all day tomorrow i have, it's like what's his name will farrell in old school i don't know maybe we'll go to bed bath and beyond at home depot like i think about that i'm like shit i don't want to do that tomorrow with a hangover and like I, that's what stops me from drinking 
Oh man, yeah, old man I, problems. I don't even go past two glasses of wine, truly, because I know the third glass of wine, I'm like, oh man, exact same thing. I'm gonna feel like shit tomorrow. How far we've come, Tucker Max, in a mm-hmm. few short years. Um, I know. And just to kind of close off on 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 that chapter, you know, what's what's that difference between being like an authentic rebranding and a bullshit one? I mean, you see it now from a different perspective. You seeing a lot of that out there. I, dude, I, like I said, I don't really pay a whole lot of attention to what other people are doing or not doing, right? Like, because I, I, it's a funny thing. I don't even think about this as a rebranding because a brand is a construction, right? I decided to change my life, right? It kind of gets back to what you're talking about, too, with being honest. Like, I just am who I am and I do what I do. And it's not a brand, right? It, um it, it was part of the problem with uh, uh, my first iteration of fame is everything was my name and myself. And now it's like, I'm doing other things and people are like, Oh, but your brand is X, uh, you know, is drinking. And I'm like, no, that's not, that's not, which I know what they mean. Like I, I understand their point, right? It's the problem though, with making your personal or your public brand, your yourself is that you then there's a certain set of people who like always see you for what you are. And it doesn't really bother me. It's fine, whatever. But I don't like, that's not how I see it. It's not how I approach it, you know? And as you, and as you should, but have you found challenges in, in, you know, the professional world, especially, you know, building scribe and, and, and the other, you know, ventures that you've had of separating that where people are still looking at you from your twenties. You're like, dude, I'm fucking 45 years old. Like, you know, like we all did shit. I mean, if I even opened up my vault to my twenties, I mean, I, (laughs) I think my wife would have to divorce me just on principle. Yeah. Right. Like, like what? But we've all done that. Right. Listen, we all we've all had our past. And those are things you just don't want to know about. Right. Like, you don't yeah. want to know. We are our wives. Like, I, that's it. I don't ever want to think about that. Just know that we're here in this moment together. And that's it. I mean, I, I wrote a bunch of books about it, so there's no hiding it for me. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, proof. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Like, um, you know, it's funny. It, it both helps and hurts. Right. So like, it's like being honest, is it being honest, a two edged sword, it cuts both ways. Same with, with uh, my past is like, it helps, it helps immensely in a lot of ways. And then we have absolutely lost a bunch of deals because of it. Well, listen, everything happens for a reason and the, and the deals that are meant to be, uh, so so subscribe, let's talk about scribe, which is awesome. I've heard you talk about it on a couple of other podcasts and it's interesting. It's, it's one of those things where I kind of look at it from that cynical new york jew kind of thing like why does everyone need to write a fucking book because some guru is telling them to do it the same thing with podcasting now you got to have a podcast you got to do this um and i've seen this movement produce some amazing pieces of work and some amazing pieces of shit and i've seen you know the great work with the right marketing go together i've seen you know shitty work with with you know it it works kind of both ways on that um was it a logical progression to get into the, the, the well, book in a box, you know, to, to get into this world? How did that journey happen? It should have been logical. And I, should, I wish I'd thought about it earlier, but it, it's like one of those things where I forget who it is. Mark Andreessen is saying that like the market will pull a product out of a startup. Right. I, I, I for, from the day I published my book, the number one question everyone asked me is how do I write a book? And so eventually I helped a woman do it and then she referred her friends to me and then that became Scribe. And so now, you know, six and a half years later, we're like well into the, I forget what our, what our sales are. I mean, we, I think we just passed 50 million in sales and we're, we're like crushing it because there's a ton of people who want this help. And so, uh, but I'll tell you, man, all I really did was start the company and help like set the frame. We have a, a professional CEO who runs it, who's Javon McCormick. A real CEO. A, a real yeah. CEO, not me. Is it like, that dude, a smart business move for any founder? Just to hire, when you have enough money, just hire someone. Because your founder is usually the one that have the ideas in the product. They, they don't know how to run a company, hire people, leadership. Dude, it's a totally lesson. different skill. It, it is a oh. totally different skill. Un, it depends on the business, but under a half million, anywhere from 5 million to 500,000, depending on the product, uh, you don't need a, a serious professional executive team. But once you get above that, for us, it was about 2 million. Like then it's like the wheels start coming off because understanding how to run a business is totally different than understanding your product, right? I know books and I know writing. I don't know scaling businesses. And so yeah, we're and a huge, oh dude, screw all that. It's awful. And and like he, he loves it and he's amazing at it. And he, he hired the full exec team and they're all amazing. And so like, I don't really do a whole lot in the business. I do like media like this and I do like, like I develop new products or I do biz dev, 
Like I do this stuff that's like fun and that I'm good at, and that's it. It's really nice, actually. That's your, Honestly, that's, it's really that's fun. Your, that's that's your strengths. But for everyone listening who's not familiar, be able to give just like a high level kind of overview of the scribe process. Yeah. So uh, what we do is we we help. If you want to write and publish a book, we're the company to go to, right? So if you want coaching, we'll coach you through writing it, and then we do the publishing. If you want someone to interview you and kind of ghostwrite it with you or for you. Then we have that process. If you want to write it yourself and just have someone professionally publish it, uh, we do all of that. Like, you know, we did David Goggins' book, Can't Hurt Me. We did Tiffany Haddish's. We've done a ton of Nassim Taleb, you know, uh, Dan Sullivan, a bunch of famous business people. Um, we're like, you know, kind of the big dog in the professional self publishes right. services space. Yeah, it's awesome. I mean, I've had, you know, I've had thoughts of it. You know, I've had thoughts of it. I've done almost 160 episodes, 80 live shows. So I have a nice body of work and with great guests like yourselves and the insights that come out of it. I'm like, well, that's kind of, I've seen people do that where they take the podcast and they pull out the insights and they add some color commentary. So it, it's a thought, it's a thought in my head. And I read recently that you want to scale this into a billion dollar company, which, yeah, that'd be awesome, right? Your ranch shopping um, gets exponential Yeah, right, bigger. exactly. I want, a, uh, I, want a, I want like the, the Kevin Costner uh, Yellowstone ranch out there. Right, exactly. No, um. Well, okay, so books and publishing won't be a billion dollar business. If, if there's a billion dollar business here, it's in providing all kinds of services around that and, and the marketing around that. Like, how do you market the book? Mm -hmm. How do you do pr branding? All So we're definitely going to build a big agency. We're already well along the, uh, the path. Um, the, anything beyond that, to get in the billion range, you got to look at software. There's managed services, stuff like that. I'll tell you, that's my CEO's goal is to build a massive conglomerate, and I'm with him, so... Like, yeah. we'll see what happens. Yeah, hell, hell yeah on that. And and it's interesting. Do you still, do you do any one-on-one -on -one coaching or advising in the, in the writing spot space? No, I mean, I, I lead the, the, some of the coaching workshops, uh, but I don't do one-on-one. -on -one. I, I do, it's weird. I do have a couple of high level coaches who come to me for coaching, like personal coaching, which is the weirdest thing, man. Like they like came to me and they're like, will you be my coach? And I'm like, what do you mean? <laughs> and they're like, because I'm, I, I, we just get along really well. And I, I don't really do anything except listen to them talk and then ask them questions. And then they have a bunch of insights and they think I'm a genius. And I've told them, they're paying, it's not they're, like, paying it's... Uh, they're paying me amazingly well. And <laughs> I've, and I've told them guys, I'm just, this is all I'm doing. And they're like, yeah, yeah, but you're really good at it. And I'm like, okay, cool. Then I'll whatever. Well, that's so what I, say, I thank help you. a couple of those people. But that's yeah, it. that's that's because my, my I was gonna I was gonna say like you know if you're coaching somebody on a, from a content perspective, you know how much do you push them to to be as open and if it is controversial to put it out there? Does that sell books? Um, yeah, it depends. So memoir, the way that we coach people is that the memoir is a two two step process. You write a memoir for yourself. It's really about understand uncovering and and recognizing and acknowledging your truth. But then you publish it for the reader, right? So you have to edit it so that like it's only the interesting parts and that you're putting all the honest, authentic parts out and not like a laundry, you know, a grocery list or nonsense, right? And so um, as to what parts do you put out and not, it really is, it just depends on a lot of factors with you, you know? Like what are you trying to do? Um, what are the consequences of the truth? Are you willing to accept those or not? Like, yeah, we help people think through that, hmm. of course, because that's a big, uh, uh, everyone, it's for everyone wants to write a book, dude. And it's not because everyone wants to be rich and famous. Everyone wants to write a book because they want to tell their story. Right. So we do a, spend a lot of time on that with people helping them understand how to do that and what that means. But not everyone wants to publish the book, which are different things. You know, is it, is it difficult to tell somebody that the story sucks and no one wants to read it? Um, the, you know, I've never met anyone who didn't have a good story in them. They might tell a shitty part of their story, right? Cause like everyone has a good story. The key is getting it out, right? Yeah. Most people, um, are afraid to tell their true story. And so they'll say the things they think they're supposed to say, which that's always boring and terrible. No one wants to hear the things you're supposed to say. They want to hear the truth. Right. Yeah, and I mean, so that's what we get <clears throat> out of people when we try do to you, do, do you miss writing long form? Uh, Why do you think I stopped? I haven't. <laughs> yeah. I know I have not published a memoir in a long time. In about, I don't know how, whatever it is, 10 years, 12 years. Uh, I'm working on my next one right now, which is about oh, like what it was like, you know, being moving to husband and father and all that kind of shit. And it's, 
it's not going to be like one of those funny we, laugh track ones where I'm going to be the cool dad. Like that's, I hate those. It's more, far more honest than authentic. I mean, what's it, what's it like, you know, at 45 to, to think about being, I mean, that probably was never even a thought at 25 being married with a kid. It was probably scary. You probably had like older cousins or relatives and you're like, oh, look at that guy. He's so lame right now. Uh, no, I always knew I would have kids. Um, I, but I'm a dude. So it's like, I didn't, I'm like, ah, that's a long time in the future. Cause we just get better with age. Right. Like if women want to have do. kids, then they have, they have a, a, a clock, right? So we don't a have a short clock. Window. Like, yeah, right. We, we can, and as so long as I, our dude, plumbing I'm, I'm is working, so, we're good. I am so glad I waited to be a dad, man. My kids are six, four and two and like, Oh God, I would have been a terrible father 10 years ago. Or 15 years ago and now i'm like at least a decent father like i'm not screwing them up very much at all whereas like 15 years ago disaster what's the worst. What, i mean i i have eight my, my daughter's almost nine my son is almost three so I'm, I'm right there with you like what what has been like you know that it's so funny too i tell people when they like p- parenting advice i go don't listen to anybody else's advice that's my advice really figure it out on your own think about your own experiences that you've had and you're gonna figure shit out like Yesterday, my uh, we're, we're we're teaching my son to potty train, and right. it, it it's been treacherous. And I got him to piss. We we play a game. I throw a leaf or a piece of paper in the toilet, and it's target practice, yeah. right? And it brought mm-hmm. back. I'm like, that's how my dad taught me, I think. And my dad's like, yeah, we did. And then I, I I go down to piss with them, and I'm like, you good? Yeah. And then he goes, I made rocks. That's what he calls when he poops himself. I'm like, we were just in the freaking bathroom, and I got so mad. I had to clean like I had to clean it out, and I'm like, this is a process. This is your job. This is the mm-hmm. this is daddy duty, literally. Yeah, yeah. And, and uh, uh, dude, it out. Uh, you're making it harder on yourself, man. <laughs> I'm just telling you. No, seriously, for potty training, like we just what's the secret? Pot, it's self directed. We let them figure it out, and, and not like we teach them how to go potty on the potty, but like we don't push them to do it at any point or time. Same with with food, right? Like. A lot of parents think, oh, well, it's by this age, they have to be doing this. And this age, they have to be doing that. And that age, no. Like, we, we, we give our kids very firm boundaries, uh, you know, safety, whatever. But within those boundaries, almost total freedom. And to let them explore and figure stuff out. Like, uh, we had one kid walking, you know, at 10 months. Another kid didn't start walking until 18 months. Okay, whatever. Yeah. Like, some whatever one talked early, one talked late. Same with potty training. One was out of diapers uh, by 18 months. The other one's two years old and still shit in his pants. Whenever he's ready, <laughs> it's a, he's, he'll, you know, it's, it's a it's, it's a journey, man. And and I want to before I bring it home with with my encore. Um, I I love your short form writing, especially what you've been doing on LinkedIn in the past year. And I and I brought up a few of these specific posts that you did, and I'd love to get mm-hmm. your thoughts on them. Um, okay. These are from the collection of Tucker Max quote lessons I've learned. Love to get your thoughts here. Quote, if I want to control a situation, my best strategy is to ask more questions rather than tell people what to do or give answers. Yeah, totally. Oh, hundred percent. I, I mean, like the, I giving answers and giving advice is ego. That's like, that's you trying to get other people to do what you doing to make you feel about better about your choice. This one I love. There's far more controlling questions than there ever is in directives. Totally. Similar to the last one. Very similar, because you ask the right questions, you get people that, people will always be more persuaded and more motiv- motivated by things they understand themselves. They figure out themselves. I think, I think this applies to what we were talking about earlier with Scribe. The world rewards the people who are best at telling the story about the idea, not the people with the best ideas. True. That's why Edison is famous and no one knows about Tesla, or at least they didn't before Musk started a company called Tesla. But yeah. Yeah. Almost, quote, almost all of my fighting with other people has nothing to do with them. It's actually me using them as a proxy to fight with myself. That's deep. Mm-hmm. deep. True. It, uh, yeah, I, I, when did you write that one? Do you remember writing that one? When did that come to you? Oh, mind? yeah. The, that was, no, I remember because I forget, like, I had some Twitter fight with somebody and I'm like, what the fuck am I doing? <laughs> It's, it's this is not, I don't even know who this person is. It's a mirror. Exactly. It's a hundred percent what it is. Yep. And, and, and the last one here, every, <laughs> every fool I've met is convinced their opinion is right. Can conceive of any other way to see it and refuses to consider other ideas. In my experience, only fools are certain. Mm-hmm. Yep. That's like a mega fortune cookie. Yeah. True. Puts Twitter <laughs> into context, doesn't it? 
It, it sure does. And, you know, this show for me is a masterclass. I get to speak to amazing folks like yourself and ask two, two or three questions that are ingrained in my education. I'm never, the thought of me going for my MBA or anything post-grad terrified me. So this, this is, this is my graduate program here. Um, Tucker Max, what is the single greatest piece of advice that you've ever received that you take action on every single day of your life? Um, man, I, this is going to sound a little bit woo woo, but it's probably the truth. It, it wasn't advice to me, but it was more of, I guess not hardly even advice. Um, it, it, the, the, the core message of the Buddha was, uh, do your work and then help others do theirs. And like, it took me 42 years to understand what he meant. Uh, and even now, like I only get, I think the most surface level of that. Uh, but like now I get it right now, at least I get it. And so now it's like, that's, if there were something defining my life, that's probably it. You know, uh, I, I do my work and then I try to help others do theirs just by telling them about how I do my work, not by telling them what to do. So it's powerful. Yeah, definitely. And, and, and speaking of powerful, I mean, what, what is your superpower, right? Like, what do you do better than almost anyone on this planet that makes you who you are? I mean, that wraps us right back to the beginning. I, I'm just not afraid to tell the truth. That's how we do it, man. And it's been interesting. The last 14 months have been crazy. Some people are, you know, experiencing terrible death, destruction, sickness, other people are prospering. It's just the haves and the have nots becoming even more clear, but there's a lot of good that's come out of this pandemic. Uh, Dude, I'd love uh, if you could share, yeah, I'd love if you could share, you know, a silver lining, a personal silver lining and a professional silver lining that you've experienced in the last year. Forget silver lining. The last year and a half has been all silver for me and my family. Like don't, March and April of last year was a little rough, right? But once we kind of like got re got reestablished um everything has been up it's been an amazing year it's been one of the best years of our life in so many ways um you know it's funny everyone says they love their family i actually like my family and uh what covid did was not just really cement that but then really got my wife and i to focus on making everything about our lives aligned and with what we really wanted with ourselves, our family, everything. My life is in an infinitely better place than it was a year ago in all ways. Companies doing better. Like, I, I mean, I know it's been hard for a lot of people. I, I, like, I hate, I, I know it's a cliche, but there is so much opportunity in chaos and you can either take that opportunity or not. You know, and I'm not saying like everyone gets the same opportunity or the same benefits or the same this or the same that. But I mean, I could have easily gone the other way. I just chose, no, I'm going to try and how do I make this work for us? And it was hard, but we did, we found a way. So yeah. I don't know. It's I, been a great year for us. I love it, man. Yeah, it's been, it's been interesting. I always say like, if it wasn't for this year, I went to made so many changes in my life, so many changes in my business, change in mindset. Um, and it, it comes with a cost. You know, being terrified of this disease, this virus that you can't see out there, the stress that comes along with it, uh, just, I wonder, if it, I wonder if our kids are going to remember this. I don't think they're going to be old enough. Oh, my six-year-old definitely will. Yeah. My I mean, his life, just... fundamentally, dude, my kids were in uh, a private school that went full lunatic woke. And so we, we pulled them out and with 50 other families started our own school. And so they went from a school that they, they, they thought they liked a lot to the new school they fucking love. Like, our, like our, they, they just think it's the greatest thing ever. So they'll totally remember it. Oh, yeah. Like, they how, love it. How, how woke is woke? I mean, like, they wanted to lecture kindergartners about uh, white supremacy. Already then, and then and on, on that note, <laughs> exactly. we're going to, we're going to, we're going to, kids, we're going to get going. We got package yeah. of shit. We got to, we ain't got to leave, but we can't stay here, kids. Let's, let's get out of here. And last but not least, Tucker, you look back on your life, this incredible, you know, body of work, this family that you've created, but it all started, you know, back in, in your twenties and in, in, in the, in the good old days. And you look back at those moments and whether you had to pull yourself up out of bed, out of the gutter, out of uh, a, 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 a shithole, and then you get to a point where you are now and you want to look back with gratitude and that common thread of tenacity pulling you through. And now you have this compass, this light, this focal point 
Tucker Max, what is your North Star in life? Uh, I, I think it, it ties back to what you just asked the other question, man. My North Star is doing my work. Like, I, I, I'm not trying to change the world. I'm not trying to do all, because I think that's bullshit. All of that is bullshit. The only thing you can do is change yourself and improve yourself. And if you do that, you have a huge impact on the people directly around you. And then that impact ripples out. Um, and that's all anyone can do. And so that's my North Star. I need to improve myself as much as I can, make myself the best person I can be and get better every day. And that's it. That's all you can do. I love it, man. Tucker Max, everybody. Thank you for spending time with me. I want everyone to check out scribemedia.com. But where could folks find you and connect with you? TuckerMax.com. Still there. Yeah. Tucker, thanks, man. I appreciate it. Hang with me for one moment here as I sign off. Um, everyone, thank you for spending time with Tucker and I on this episode. If you liked it, please leave a review. Rating goes a long way. Share it with your friends. Sharing means caring. You know where to find out more at thepodcast.com for all the latest. We appreciate you listening. Remember, take care of each other. Stay six feet apart and catch us next week for another great episode of the podcast. Wisdom is forever, but for us, it's time to go. Thank you for joining us. Luckily, we'll be back with our next episode soon, jam-packed with more incredible humans. Thank you for listening, subscribing, and sharing. To join the conversation, search The Pausecast on LinkedIn. And to catch up on past episodes and more info, please visit www.thepausecast.com.